The first and foremost thing is we've got to recognize what ventilation will do. It's got a limitation. First, do no harm. It's sort of like the medical doctors. First, do no harm. We cannot deal with carbon monoxide poisoning. I'll get into that later because I have a personal story to tell you. The purpose for ventilation is because we need to have fresh air for living and breathing for people. And I'll get into all the counter arguments why you shouldn't put ventilation in the house because that's what you're going to be hit with with people on the street today. Because why should you seal up the house as Larry and Dave has done an exemplary job here and then have someone with a gun to your head to have to put in ventilation to the house that you thought was going to come with it by the unavoidable leaks. Well, those days are gone, and I'm hoping to convince you sufficiently that you'll be comfortable in talking to a future owner as to why there's a huge advantage in sealing up a house properly and putting in ventilation, even though each of these two steps have an added cost over code minimum systems today. So we're really providing ventilation for living, breathing people, and of course the odor and moisture of kitchen and bath. But the second step isn't generally a hard sell because people today are generally buying kitchen fans or buying bathroom fans. Yes, it's a code requirement, but it's not a hard sell because people have an ongoing appreciation for the need on having exhaust in both of those rooms. But one thing that I want to make absolutely clear, because I think you're going to be entering an era right now of this green movement. And yes, I'm an environmentalist to a point, and I think of common sense though has got to be more important. And one thing that's most important is that ventilation will always add to your cost of heating. There is no free lunch. And I want to make that really, really, really clear. Ventilation is not to save energy. Ventilation is for the health of people. Your saving of energy, is going to get into a little bit later, but is building a proper enclosure that's insulated and where the wind doesn't blow through it in the wintertime. That's where the savings come from. The ventilation is strictly for human health. It'll always raise the cost of operating. And don't worry about radon. Not only is it not an issue here, but it's not a ventilatable pollutant. These are not things you can ventilate out. They have to be cured at the time of new construction. First of all, circulation is not ventilation. Circulation is good for heating and cooling. In heating and cooling, you're circulating air inside a house, adding heat, you're taking away heat with the cooling system. It's great for dehumidification. Not a big, huge issue here, but in some places it is. It's really, really good for air cleaning. There's no finer way to clean the air in this room by circulating air and putting it through filters. It really, really works. In fact, if you look carefully at that light from the projector, you see all the particles in the air right now? Those are respirable particles you will not see in normal conditions. And those can be removed with a forced air system if you put in good filtering. Also, if you put in good filtering, you never have to clean your ductwork again because cleaning ductwork is just a stunt to clean the garbage that shouldn't have been there if the filters were doing a proper job. But we don't buy filters today for people. We buy filters to protect equipment. You can also, if you build a leaky house, they stratify. The air is cool in the basement. It gets very hot at the ceiling. If you circulate air, you can mask the symptoms of crappy construction. And a lot of people are running fans continually at two speeds to try to take the warmth from upstairs to make it comfortable in the basement. And yet we're pretty darn comfortable in here because this basement has been built properly. That destratification reduced differences. And of course, the circulation is for furnaces and air conditioning heat pumps. Circulation is not ventilation. And the public keeps on saying, if I got circulating air with a forced air system, I don't need ventilation. That's bogus. And I hope to convince you today that while well, that was true 30 years ago, it is not today. So again, I stress, and this is recognized in ASHRAE about 50 years ago, there's a standard in ASHRAE 62 that is specifically for ventilation and standard 52 for thermal comfort. And these are completely unrelated. The thermal comfort in this house in the future will come from its high level of insulation and its draft freeness. The ventilation is completely unrelated, and that's the concept of having an ongoing air exchange for people. So, ventilation is a universal requirement for the health and safety of occupied buildings. To make matters worse, there's three types. The building code deals with winter ventilation, because our ventilation systems here in Canada are designed from the time you close up your house in the end of the summer until you open up your house in April or May. It's winter ventilation. 
and that winter ventilation is designed to provide for the health and safety of people when the house is closed up. It has nothing to do with activity ventilation, which is the belief in Canada that we should have sufficient exhaust in the bathroom and sufficient exhaust in the kitchen that we can take a dump, take a shower, cook in the kitchen, and we are not going to be polluting the overall house with living uh, those activities. But never be confused with summer ventilation, which is a different animal again, and the public confuses this, especially in August. They figure that their ventilation system should cool them. Summer ventilation, or also called free cooling, is this concept of bringing in a vast quantity of outdoor air, which we can do in the evenings here in the Lower Mainland, by bringing in a whole bunch of outdoor, because it's a little bit cooler than your house. If your house has been accumulating heat all day, you can cool it down by bringing in a vast quantity of outdoor air. In fact, we've known by experimental houses, if you bring in a vast quantity, you can get about a half a ton or one ton of cooling ability with a 1,500 or 2,000 cubic foot a minute furnace, bringing in 100% outdoor air and relieving it through a skylight. So just remember, when we talk about ventilation, that there's three separate categories of ventilation, and those categories are different from circulation, which are needed for heating and for cooling. Ventilation requires an air exchange with outdoors, and the assumption is, and there's good science to show it, outdoor air in almost all cases is superior to indoor air. Almost all cases. The problem is the public will confuse ventilation with circulation or the condition of air. One of the problems that we have in construction today is that we have a really, really bad misuse of terms. If you want to advance your knowledge and advance that of your crew, you have to use the right terminology, the right words to describe what you want. And that's part of the reason I'm belaboring the use of these words here. The issue of carbon monoxide is something that is passionate to me personally. We were involved in, uh, I guess you could say, a first call when there was a death in Fairmont Hot Springs in Christmas of 1999. It took us 10 years after being aware of this at the day it happened, the night it happened, to bash through freedom of information, the coroner's office, even get this information disclosed to the gas fitters of the province as to exactly what happened. Well, the sad fact was is that the woman died within four hours of carbon monoxide poisoning and her daughter is now brain dead from going into this house, driving from Calgary, going into this duplex, Six o'clock on December 24th, 1999, she was dead at 10 o'clock and her daughter was brain dead as a direct result. People talk about carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide. Carbon dioxide is not a, a threat at all and yet you hear this battered around all the time. It's a serious health liability. Carbon monoxide is an issue that I wanna focus on. When you're burning natural gas, and I passionately believe in natural gas, partly because I'm cheap, and gas will heat you for a third the price today of electricity. But the problem is when you burn natural gas, there's three steps to burning it. You start off with methane. When you add oxygen, the first thing you do is you get water. The first thing that happens, you produce water from that combustion. Number two, if you have enough temperature and time, you get carbon monoxide. This stuff is viciously lethal. Again, if you have enough time and temperature and oxygen, you will oxidize this and it'll become carbon dioxide and it becomes completely safe. These are all odorless, colorless. You're not aware of any of it happening, but this stuff kills people real fast. It came to my mind a little bit here and it hit me over the head. My niece just decided, a little bit paranoid perhaps, decided she put a carbon monoxide detector in her house. It was done in the fall, and when she closed up their house, about a month later it triggered. It was rather interesting what happened. There's supposed to be zero carbon monoxide in the house because carbon monoxide is something that your body will take up in preference to oxygen. When you die of carbon monoxide poisoning, you're not really dying of carbon monoxide poisoning, you're dying from a lack of oxygen because your body will pick up carbon monoxide 400 times better, faster than oxygen. So it's like dessert. Well, what happened was is she had the legal maximum in a house is zero and she had 150 parts per million in the basement. And in the vent pipe above this boiler, 
she had 500 when there was only 100 allowed. What had happened is this boiler was put in with a bunch of installation deficiencies, but it had sooted up so bad that no air can get through it, the chimney wasn't drafting properly, and the whole thing was spilling carbon dioxide into the house. They were completely unaware of this happening. Just because I'm cheap, we spent the following weekend and we took five quarts of soot out of a 90,000 BTU boiler. A gas fitter friend of mine went back in, commissioned it, repiped piped it because it was incorrectly done from 25 years ago it was installed, and it's now working safely. But don't screw around with carbon monoxide. I'd like to introduce a brief introduction to ventilation because you are going to be going out from this room into the unwashed, people that know nothing about ventilation, and you can't just go out with a little wee shiny pitch with ventilation because it's way too complicated that you can blow it off or answer a customer's question in one minute. I'd like to give you the confidence of a history of where ventilations come from and why it's important because the people who ask you about ventilation, generally speaking, are your only top 5, 10%. And if they ask you, never, ever, ever today bullshit a customer. Dr. Google is too smart for you to match him, so you can only do that with truth and knowledge. This is one of the first books that I saw some years ago, and I was quite fascinated about it. I'm generally contemptuous of architects because they have absolutely no concept of reality in building. But with that aside, this was an architect, but I'm sure it's because he was a master builder before he was made an architect, because years ago you had to know what you're doing to become an architect. Well, this guy wrote a book in 1850, which was before the US Civil War, probably before the oldest one of you dudes was born. But the result was, is he had a chapter dedicated to warming and ventilation. It was chapter 13. I mean, as an architect, there's only respect for mechanical, of course, to put it in the back of the book. But he did do it, and this was so well written, it's been republished, actually. It's quite good. The opening sentence in the last chapter says, there is no subject directly connected with domestic life on which there's such a large amount of popular ignorance. Well, I love it because it's a dead ringer for public lack of awareness today. The closing sentence at the last paragraph of that chapter, the lack of a ventilation arising, the lack of attention arising from the fact that the poison of breathing bad is a slow one, its effects are only little by little. It's, I think, a dead ringer for the public awareness today. It's simply not there. And my sort of soapbox opinion is right now is that we are not really looking after our health the way we should be. Because if we're sick, we immediately think it's a state response where we go to the hospital and they're supposed to fix us up. The hospital system, the healthcare system is going broke, and we've got to start taking responsibility for ourselves. And air quality is just one of those components. When I was younger, I went to school in Sardis, and our school was built very similarly to this one, which is still standing and being used in Chilliwack. In the 1910-1920, there was a huge awareness in ventilation all over North America, and the focus of attention was on schools, because when you shove 30 kids into a classroom and you try to get them to learn, bringing on new knowledge and new information is very hard when people are asleep from bad air quality. So there was huge research at the beginning of the last century to understand ventilation, and there was a huge argument about how much ventilation does every student want. Well, the beauty of it is this system was completely passive and worked beautifully. You still see there's probably 20 schools around the country to this province right now that have these big, huge cupolas. The way they worked, it was a chimney draft that drafted air out of the school 24 hours a day. And those corridors were linked to the classroom by doors, which had big, huge transfer grills in the bottom of the doors. And these windows were 12 feet. Those classrooms are 12 feet high partly because they wanted to have light come in far enough the farthest student from the windows would have adequate light because light was perceived to be important. But it also gave the benefit of that top window being openable. So what happened is, as the air came in through the top window, it would fall down onto the big hot water heating registers at the base, and it would provide some lift in the air. The air would go past the classroom students into the corridor and go up the chimney. And it was very, very simple and extremely effective. 
and just actually was made aware of this in that the Burnaby Museum at their C4 school had exactly that type of hopper window way up at the top of a 12-foot ceiling on a chain. There's a long rod that goes on and hooks that one. In my classroom, they had a little rope and you could pull it and you could proportion the window opening. It really, really works well. I had the benefit of going to the museum, the railway museum in Squamish, and I had a real eye-opener there. Two railway cars stuck out of my mind graphically. One was a 1920s car, and one was a 1950s car that were sitting on a siding that you could walk through as a visitor. I thoroughly enjoyed my time there. This one had ventilation by means of these grills in the roof, and it had openable windows. And when I walked through this, this car, it was fresh, it felt really good in that car. I walked into the newer car 30 years later and all I could smell was mold and mildew. Here's a, tier, a situation where air conditioning came on in the 40s and 50s, which in the southern states is critical for dehumidification, but it resulted in the worship of ventilation and the complete neglect for the fact that people need an air exchange. This had zero air exchange, and you could just smell the mold and the mildew from that being used from 30 years with zero or almost no ventilation. In fact, here they make a very conspicuous mark when you walk into that car to keep the door closed, because presumably the air conditioning was so marginal it couldn't carry any ventilation on top of the, the sun coming in and the people. So we've gone from the 1920s of an awareness and ventilation, air conditioning come on stream in the 40s and 50s and 60s, which having lived in Texas for three years, I can see why it was worshipped for the beautiful benefits of dehumidification. But we're now at the crossroads right now, where I think we're just starting to wake up for ventilation but people still approach me and ask, should I air condition my house or ventilate my house? And that question you will find on the street today. One of the more modern pieces of research that was done was absolutely superb, and it was done in Copenhagen. A Dr. Ole Fanger did a really very simple test. And what he did, he wanted to find out, well, how much air exchange do we need for the health of people? So he got a TELUS telephone booth, or the equivalent, and he'd stand up a person on the street corner of Copenhagen and put that person inside. And they had a ventilation system on the top of the telephone booth that would vary a ventilation rate for one cubic foot a minute right on up to 100 cubic feet a minute. And their objective of the game was to try to find out how much air exchange would it take. But then, of course, how do you judge whether it's satisfactory? He said there's no scientific instrument that can actually measure the quality of air in a space so maybe we should go back to nature and ask, what does the human nose say? So what he did is he stood this person up on the street corner of Copenhagen. He bores a hole at the five foot level so people can go by and take a sniff of the person inside. Now being a scientist, what he did is he made sure that this was a repeatable experiment by making sure the human had fresh underwear every day and a shower so it was somewhat a repro reproducible experiment. The results of three years' work can be summarized in one page, and to me that's the beauty of really, really good research to advance your knowledge without a 100-page report that no one in their right mind would read. So you can summarize his entire results in one page. What he basically said is you measure dissatisfaction of 10% dissatisfied, meaning 90% are satisfied, and as you get into the area of 50% are dissatisfied, you would obviously have 50% were satisfied. In other words, since this is a sliding curve, you can never satisfy everyone. And as you're a builder today, you'll notice you have some tough clients you can never satisfy, and some are easy to satisfy. Well, ASHRAE, both in thermal comfort and air quality, has set a 20% dissatisfaction, meaning to say it's reasonable to satisfy 80% of the visitors. And a visitor is this dude who's walking his way to Copenhagen job. He's outside in the air. His nose is awake and fresh. He smells that human, and he rates that human on green or orange and red. And the 80% satisfaction was the pass, which is measured in the tune of about, oh, the ventilation rate here was about 15 thereabouts cubic feet per minute. And as simple as this is, what we've learned is the whole world now is following this research and the highest accolades that could be awarded to Ole Fanger were awarded for his work on that. 
And it's interesting now that we're using that in Canada and certainly in BC. Even more recently, there was some work done by ASHRAE just to try to illustrate how we pollute the air in a space. Here's a 12-year-old girl that she's sitting here, standing actually, she's producing about 80 watts of heat. And you can see by means of this Schlieren photo technique, how her body pollutants and her odor and moisture and all of it's rising on a convection plume. You don't think about this happening unless you remember when people were smoking, the cigarette smoke would always rise to the ceiling. And in places where people have smoked, the ceilings were always filthy from the nicotine tars that rose up on the combination of the plume of the hot cigarette and the heated person beside it. So this is sort of a visual indicator of what we're trying to do is where a razor awareness. If you climb on an airplane and you fly to Toronto, you're going to ride in the, where I do, in the seven cubic foot a minute seats. First class gets 50 and the pilot they keep awake with 150 cubic feet. And the reason they chintz on the air quantity is because it costs an awful lot of money to compress air into an airplane. And this seat costs $1 less to fly to Toronto than the seat with 15 cubic feet a minute because of the cost of compression. So they're going to squeeze as much as they can to reducing the outdoor air quantity until public complain. My personal pet peeve right now is a slide I picked up here recently to do with cancer. The International Agency for the Research in Cancer found that 80 to 90% of human cancer is determined environmentally. Think about it, which makes it avoidable. Think about it. But medical historians Hans Rusch concluded that less than 10% of that cancer's money is spent on looking at environmental issues. You can summarize all this in that our air and our food and our water are critical to human health, but the problem is, is the public has not completely made that link in the air quantity quality issue. They're waking up now to water and they're waking up now to food. So everything I talk about today is based on a cubic foot. And you need 15 of these every minute to provide you a healthy environment to live in. Some people say you need a half an air change hour in your house or a third. It's all bullshit. The air exchange you need in a house is predicated on the number of people that house was intended for. And to make that calculation easy, we assume two people in the first bedroom one person thereafter, and our building codes are wrapped around the concept that we're ventilating for people. There's still some academic challenges to that conclusion, but don't go there because they'll be spinning their wheels and asking the question, what are we ventilating for for the next 50 years? We have to move ahead and work on the basis of what we know today. I will get into a little bit more, but the biggest single that we've, problem that we face in buildings today in a ventilation area is moisture. And the simple fact of life is, is we think that the moisture that we produce in our shower is the big bugaboo that we've got to deal with. The problem, however, is we completely miss the point that people, each of us individually, are breathing out about a quarter moisture every day, just from our body pores and from our breath. If any of you have been building long enough or any of you have come from areas where natural gas is not used, but specifically Vancouver Island where they didn't have gas until 20 years ago, the ongoing problem there is mold and mildew goes through all houses because with lack of ventilation and high price heat, you got a vicious combination where people close up the house, they'll turn down the heat, and the moisture problems are really acute. Dr. Fugler, Don Fugler, was one of the best speakers we've had at Teca in 20 years. He's another one of these scientists that's practical, and he summarizes years of work into one page. He basically said that four people in a house produce about four liters, he's metric, I'm not, four quarts of moisture in a day at roughly a quart per person. That's a serious amount of moisture that we're putting into a house that we've got to recognize, and the only plausible way of getting rid of is ventilation, which is where I'm going with this whole thing. It's interesting, four showers don't hold a candle to the moisture of people living in that house. And yet the public perception is that the bathroom moisture is the biggest problem in the house. You can see that five plants is not too much different than four showers. Gas cooking has twice the moisture released from electric cooking because, of course, gas has water in it, as you well know from the first slide. Burning of natural gas creates water. 
Now, one of the things you might ask is, is what is the proper moisture level in a house? The problem is today we don't use the proper terminology. We use the term humidity. The problem is this humidity by itself is not a good word. There's absolute humidity and relative humidity. Relative humidity is what we want to talk about inside a house. And relative humidity, if you were to ask your doctor and he was informed about environment of people's houses, and most are not, but if you were to ask a doctor, he would suggest that 50% is where you'd want to be. And 50% is difference, is the midpoint between being dry as a firecracker, which by the way, if when you're 40,000 feet up in a 747, the relative humidity is basically 1%. There's zero. That's why you shouldn't drink in an airplane because that's a dehydrator as well as the air. You should be drinking a lot of fluids when you fly to make up because your losses while you're flying are two, three, four times more than you would be here when we're sitting at 50%. 100% is what happens is when you have a whole cloud that you can barely see across the room, the room is saturated. The halfway point is where we would like to be. So the problem is though, we have to serve two masters and this is a problem because we have to compromise. The medical doctor would say 50% was good. If you're down here and you pet your dog, you electrocute the poor bugger when you touch his nose. And up here, you get mold and mildew. This is where the human body wants to be, but the problem is the second master we have to serve is that of the house. And most houses can't take 50% of the midwinter because the cold water pipes, the windows, the window sash, anything that's cold will sweat. So especially when you go into the colder climates, we have to start compromising human health and dropping the relative humidity to what the building will tolerate. The beauty of this building is when you build into a higher thermal performance, you can maintain the higher humidity because there's not one thing in this house that will be cold enough to condense at the human desired 50% relative humidity. So when we're looking with moisture problems, the first thing we have to do is we have to make sure we get rid of the unventilatable problems, which is chimney vent problems and rising damp. This is a real bugaboo in the lower mainland. When you're building on hard, undisturbed clay or non-perking soil, you probably never thought about it before, but you'll probably do a good job of poly underneath the slab. But if you thought about underneath your footing, when your footing is on hard pan, that water is wicking up through that and rising up and concrete moisture will rise a mile. So it has no problem coming up three, four, five feet. And the humidity problems we're dealing with older houses right now in the lower mainland is out of control because of the mammoth effect from rising damp. And anyone today who puts a footing on undisturbed hard bearing and uses a stud and poly and bat method of insulating those walls is an idiot because that moisture is gonna rise up and it's gonna rot and the building science community call that the white dip, wet diaper approach insulating a wall. It's being done throughout because it's the lowest cost way of meeting the insulation requirements and gives you a finished basement. But the building science behind that is garbage and shouldn't be allowed. This is a big problem in old houses, but we are not dealing with it adequately today. Radon gas, forget about it, it's not your problem. High volatile organic compounds. The three quick and dirty things is the biggest factor on the indoor air quality in a new home right now is your paint selection, your carpeting, and the cabinetry material. Those are the highest emitting sources in new constructions. And it doesn't take much to avoid those because you can if you're, if you're wise. The rest of the pollutants, which are primarily for people, are those that you can ventilate. You cannot take on those first four. The public, however, is starting to wake up on the belief that houses are too tight because we've been promoting in Canada, one of the leading nations in the world are promoting tightness, but we're not equally promoting the fact that while tightness is a benefit for thermal comfort and economy, the ventilation has to be used today even more than the past as we're starting to wake up. Our public today are looking at solutions from last century, open a window. The problem with opening a window is, is that the air coming in is gonna come in and it's gonna fall immediately on the floor. 
and the public will always close up a window if they're thermal comfort, discomforted, because in our culture, comfort takes precedence over health. We should allow, allow law baseboard heating because the perception is, is electric baseboard heating creates moisture. Electric baseboard heating doesn't create moisture, but the fact is it's perceived to create moisture because in houses which have baseboard heating, they typically have the biggest mold and mildew problems because they don't have chimneys, and I'll get into that later. We should outlaw thermal, non-thermal break windows, which we've done, but we've just taken away a place for moisture to condense to, and we've now transferred it to the back closets and onto the plumbing pipes. So this was a brilliant Canadian cure of a symptom, not the fundamental problem that was causing it. We should install forced air heating because there's a perception of circulating air as ventilation, but I'll show to you today that it's not true today, but it was 30 years ago. And we should sl slash the poly vapor barrier because, of course, there's a complete lack of understanding of protection of the building from moisture and that of making it a thermally comfortable place to live. Or install a bigger bathroom fan. This is the ignorance that you're going to be facing on the street today. The bathroom fans that we were installing a few years ago were 50 cubic feet a minute. And most of the older houses were ducted with three inch slinky. If you combine the over optimistic rating of the previous fans and an inadequate duct, these fans on average were moving about 25 cubic feet a minute. And if you ran them for half an hour, you'd get about 600 cubic feet a minute of air exchange when we now know from Dr. Ole Fanger that you need 20,000 cubic feet in a 24-hour day, and that's why we were never achieving good results with those fans, is they weren't rated properly, they weren't breathing freely, and they weren't run enough. So there's no way that we're going to be able to accomplish things unless we start running properly ducted fans with more time. But this is the perception that we have today, this is what we needed. And a family of seven, we're way up here into a much higher amount. This is a massive amount of air. Like just for instance, right now, this is 2,000 pounds. That's a pickup truck full of air that you need in your house every day just for one person. Each of these is a tenth of a pound. We're talking serious amount of air, but a very small amount continually. The rationale for believing that we need ventilation is that houses are getting tighter. By and large, as evidenced by the city of Vancouver's requiring duct, uh, blow, uh, blower door tests for 10 years, houses are not getting tighter. Houses are tighter in colder climates because the public would shoot the builders if they weren't built. But here we're building the leakiest Swiss cheese houses of anywhere in the country, and we got away with it because we're in the mildest climate. We are not putting in ventilation now because houses are getting tighter. That's what the story is being told. The real story is, is that on gas heated houses, we've eliminated our chimneys, which I will show are what provided ventilation for the last 50 years in all of the provinces that had access to natural gas. We have major problems and have always had major problems with moisture problems in electrically heated houses. What people don't want to tell you is the furnaces that we had up until a few years ago had a draft diverter and a combustion air intake. And the same with a water tank, a draft diverter, and a combustion air intake at the bottom of the water tank. There's two beautiful things that happened with these older appliances. You had an ongoing exhaust of 30, 40, 50 cubic feet a minute nonstop all year. In fact, you could increase your ventilation by turning up your water tank temperature because it's just a hollow core and air will go up through the chimney. And the other thing, it masked a lot of the sins of really bad basement construction because the water that was capillaring up the wall, evaporating into the basement, was caught up in these draft diverters and combustion air and would be exited from the house before it got in and condensed on the closets and the clothing upstairs. So for right up until 2000, this provided wonderful ventilation in the house by the fact these chimneys were there. And it was made even better because when you bring in outdoor air to this return, whenever that furnace started up, air came in and it distributed to all the rooms of the house. It's a beautiful, 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 simple system. This is the reason that we have not been haunted with moisture problems in most of the gas-fired areas for this last 50 years is because we had a silent, invisible system looking after it for us. 
The problem is today, though, is that the new furnaces today cannot be this design. They're all condensing. They have zero air exchange now as part of their burning fuel. Yes, they're safer. Yes, they're more efficient, but there's zero ventilation. And the marketplace today is putting in more on-demand heaters, which have zero ability to ventilate the house as a standard water tank would do years ago. So just a warning, if you're going to change out your furnace or change out your water tank and your house is on the cusp of being a moisture producer now, that change will push you over to the point where you may not have problems today, but you will have when you make those upgrades. Okay, so what factors govern the space heating cost of a house? We've got to put things in perspective for you. The first thing that determines the cost of heating a house other than the climate is the fuel cost. Gas right now is a third the price of electricity. The only way electricity comes close to economically matching gas if you use extremely efficient heat pumps. And they will just now, air source, will just now match gas. Geos will just beat gas. But right now, across the board, gas right now is a giveaway compared to the punitive second tier pricing for electricity today. Second factor is climate, but of course you're not going to have anything to do with that. And the building losses are basically skin and leakage. Skin is reduced by insulation. Drafts are reduced by tightening up the house, which gives a benefit. And way back at the bottom, your building loss is going to be about 15% allocation due to ventilation. So the moral of the story, from an HVAC point of view, houses only have a loss go through windows and doors and walls through insulation that isn't maybe as high as it could be. This is what I would call shoddy construction because drafts have no reason to be there. That to me is just pure shoddy construction. And ventilation, which is mechanical exchange. The factors which govern the annual cost for ventilation, so we're taking that last component, which is only 15%, and the biggest factor is the air exchange rate. The air exchange rate is how much air I'm going to bring into the house, and that's why we're so darn happy now our ventilation is linked to bedrooms. That's really, really, really important. The cost of the heating fuel used, of course, is a big factor. And the climate, the, the cost of electricity, because we're moving air with fans. Then we have the climate. The interesting thing is, is you're going to be told over the next few years by everyone that is non-accountable, which means they're public sector employed, provincial and federal workers, that the whole ventilation cost is going to be totally attributed to whether you use heat recovery ventilator, and secondly, and whether it's got what its recovery efficiency is. You can see it's five and six in the hierarchy of what's covering or attributing your losses attributable to ventilation. And I'm going to get into this more because what's happening right now, people are putting in stupidly oversized ventilation systems that are noisy, they're being turned off, and they're leaking like mad, which is where we're going to go here shortly. I won't get into the details of this, but for any of you who really want to know, there was a, a lady, Brittany Hannum, that spent two weeks and taking a look at all the ventilation options that you can do in the building code and what she's done for small houses, medium houses and big houses and all the climates and all the fuel types be able to say in any situation what is your allot allotment of electricity for your ventilation and what is your heat cost of all the systems that you can do. It's wonderful work and she did it all on a volunteer basis. If any of you today like the concept of ventilation, you want to do a proper job of it, the most important thing you can do right now is find yourself a trusted HVAC contractor. Preferably has red seal sheet metal qualifications. He's been through at least the TECA course on ventilation and hopefully the other two air source courses. But the bottom line is if you are doing ventilation today and you're working with someone that doesn't have a current stamp that person has made no commitment to their future education, which is stupid because that course is based on the legal minimum of the building code. And you have a pool of a thousand people right now, probably more like 1100 that are qualified to knowing what's required. And at least you have a beginning in the selection process. The BC building code, I think is quite beautifully done. It is now recognizing that people need ventilation. And the changes right now are fresh air to distribution to bedrooms is now required. The bedroom is the most important room of the house because it's small, it's closed, 
and you're in there for extended times. That building code today is for the first time ever is requiring air exchange in the bedroom because health problems were showing up in electric baseboard and hot water heated houses where there's no air exchange in those rooms. And that unfortunately is a fairly big cost premium to do that. The sizing of that principal system is based on ASHRAE standard 62 and it's primarily a people-based standard but we've got politics in there right now and we're throwing in a little bit of ventilation at the tune of 10 cubic foot a minute per thousand square feet. That was thrown in to provide a little bit of ventilation for the building and to deal with the monster houses. But the dominant factor is, is the seven and a half CFM, it was reduced from 15 per person based on a bedroom count. That is the biggest single change that we've had in the building code now for 30 years. All bedrooms must have an air exchange. And we're gonna get into the fact that there are four methods by which you can meet those requirements. There are four separate methods, completely separate from one another. And the rates are very simple, it's all in a table. You just look at how many bedrooms you got, zero to one, two to three, four to five, six to seven, and you look at your square footage, and it just pick a number. What is criminal what's happening right now in this province, how many of you people are building secondary suites? Sure, it's starting to become much, much more common with the price of property being what it is. Well, a secondary suite, as you know, can't be over 900 and what, 60 square feet. So what's going on to secondary suites right now, if you've got something that's under 1,500 square feet and zero to one bedroom, possibly even two, you maybe have 30 CFM and people are putting 100 cubic foot a minute principal fan systems into secondary suites. Completely ludicrous. The current code allows oversizing. We're going to try the best of our ability to put a cap on that so you can't be stupid and put in systems that are way too big. Ventilation has downsides for being too big. And the whole code is based upon a principal fan. You can use an HRV as a principal fan. But the principal fan is one based on that table. Its size is based, uh, the cost is based on the size of that fan. And that one principal fan has to be quiet. It has to run continually. One of my points that I want to make is I cannot believe the stupidity that's going into even the installation of a simple bathroom fan. This is a first class Panasonic fan and it's done properly because you can see the duct comes off that fan in a nice straight fashion. Here the duct comes off the fan and immediately into an elbow. So so. This fan comes out of here and immediately into flex. But let's look at the impact, because this is going on in multi-million dollar houses across the board today. As you can see from this fan, which way is that fan turning? I'm lying on the, base, on the floor looking up. Which way is it turning? Looking up. Counterclockwise, right? OK, the air is already coming off this wheel with a predisposition to a counterclockwise spin. This is your ideal because you're giving it a chance to straighten out before you put a bend in it. This is almost as good because you're spinning this with hard metal duct in the direction it was already predisposed to turning. But any idiot that does this is going to take a 30% penalty, make a hell of a lot more noise, and reduce the air exchange on that fan that you paid good money for. So you've degraded the fan. By the way, the fan motor doesn't care. You can be an idiot, it doesn't hurt the fan motor, but you're not gonna do a good job of ventilating that bathroom and you're gonna make more noise and it's gonna be above the zone level rate you paid for it because the, you can bet that no manufacturer is gonna put his fan in a test lab, ask the sound level rating to be in a botched up installation like that because it's just marketing stupidity. Do you know how if you tell if your bathroom fan works properly? You know the Mickey Mouse answer, you put toilet paper, that just tells it's sucking but it doesn't tell you the volume. If you want to know how well your bath fan works, it's real easy. Climb out of the shower, your bathroom door is closed. With your feet still wet, stand beside the bathroom door. If there's a huge draft going over your feet, you know that bathroom fan's working because it's sucking air across your feet and cooling them off. I mean, you can be scientific about it, but at least that way you know your fan's working properly. Kitchens and bathrooms require ventilation. There's no energy cost associated with using them, and you know why, because they're not being used enough of the day and over the year to add up. <coughs> This was a very, very controversial kitchen requirement. The passive house people are madder than hell. 
but it was put there for two reasons. Number one, the gas companies did not realize, want the public to wake up to the fact you get massive carbon dioxide from using gas ovens and putting a cold, cold pot on a gas flame. I like gas, gas is good to cook on, but you gotta recognize that it comes with the absolute needed needs to provide exhaust for it. The other reason is the smoke detectors right now in multifamily housing were being triggered. People got pissed and disconnected them. So one person's health was, and safety were being reduced by the negligence on the, f the offending party by disconnecting smoke detectors because the ki kitchen cooking was triggering them. Generally speaking, this isn't controversial. People recognize bathroom need ventilation. Generally, we're seeing 85s go in right now. The good 85s will go to 30 continuous, which is nice. This is considered a code equivalent because if you exhaust with a central system 24 seven and you got say an 80 CFM system, you split it four ways, you could actually provide code required ventilation to four bathrooms with a central system. And so a lot of good quality houses are using that technique right this moment. So 50 is good on the short term, 20 is good in the long term. This is a little bit inadequate in the short term. This is dismally inadequate in the long term. And the reason is, is when you take a shower, your bath mat, your towel, everything is soaking wet for 12 hours. It's a pig to dry bathrooms in the lower mainland. The only place worse is in Tofino because it's so difficult to get things dry. You really need to have constant exhaust from a bathroom because the towels will not dry in 30 minutes. There are four methods by which you can comply with the BC Building Code. I'm gonna go over these one at a time. We call it number example one, two, three, and four. And this house is using example 2A, where it is using an HRV, and I believe, Mike, it is using a forced air system for distribution of the fresh air. Was this gas fired or heat pump? Uh, gas backup, heat pump. Heat pump first, gas backup. So the fresh air for the HRV is going into the furnace. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm gonna go over each of these really briefly. Each of them has a capital cost, each has an operating cost. But remember, the biggest thing to control operating costs is to size it correctly. And what we're gonna show later is, if you put in a system that's 100 CFM and you've got 50 CFM leakage, you're paying the penalty of 100 CFM system in capital and operating, but you're only getting 50 CFM of effect. Number one, this is a replica of what we had in furnaces 50 years ago. Whereas before we had a chimney to provide exhaust, the ex existing acceptable system has a bathroom fan to provide continuous exhaust and the fresh air comes in to the furnace, the furnace runs continually. Extremely simple, cost effective, quiet. The code doesn't say so, but here's a case where you wanna spend money on the furnace and buy one of the EC motors so you can control the electric cost there because you have to run that fan and this continuously and this is the workhorse for the whole province right now where there's gas and where there's forced air. That system is simple, effective, and it meets all the code requirements. Number two, you can use a, a, a HRV, heat recovery ventilator, which is being done in this particular house. And this is basically the legal minimum is to exhaust from one single point, which is stupid in this climate. You should be exhausting from each bathroom to dry those towels. The legal minimum is one point. Here, the system we're checking, I think you said there were seven exhaust points in the main central HRV. The fresh air is coming in, it's picking up heat from the old, and it's going into the furnace, and this heat pump air handler furnace is running 24 seven. This air coming in here, if it's put into here without this running, will not work because this small amount of air will go through the nearest return air grill. It will not reach the bedroom, so it will not be compliant. That is very, very practical. And when we were manufacturing HRVs, about 50% of our sales were going into this kind of configuration. If you're going into a hot water heated house, which you're seeing in a lot of areas where there's a bit more budget for heating or where there's no air conditioning requirement, that fresh air is being installed but it's going into every level of the house and every bedroom. So here, there were bedrooms upstairs, so every bedroom would have fresh air. You'd have at least one fresh air grill on each level that didn't have a bedroom. So it's very minimal distribution. Generally, the cost of putting these in is not the equipment, it's the duct system. 
and right now it's not being policed and it's one of the reasons we're going to run a duct blast test to show you what's really important right now that's not being caught by energy auditors or by building inspector because it's in an area of just just not being watched a very simple one that came up that's being used all over the province in multifamily buildings because it's a lower capital cost is the idea of a principal exhaust fan but a very miniature forced air heating system where you have living room air mixing with outdoor air and delivered to bedrooms. There's no heat recovery. It's very, very simple. It's very, very effective, and it's a lower capital cost. And again, it works very well in any climate, typically only used where there's not forced air. If there's forced air, you go back to example one because it's a lower ca capital cost. But if your hot water heated or your baseboard heated, it's multifamily, this is winning a lion's share of the market right now. Again, it can be effective and transparent if it's done properly. This one is being used throughout BC and everything except Kamloops North, it will comply. But when you're dealing with a secondary suite or any baseboard or non-forced air heat, single level building, this is being used by the millions and millions and millions of Europe. You have one principal exhaust fan running continually very small amount of depressurization and you have inlet air cut into your bedrooms way up just below the ceiling. The standard flack from this is why should I spend money to seal it up and then spend money to cut a hole? It's very simple. Any kind of house that's built with quality for comfort is tight as the dickens. If you put in an opening at your position of choice that's well above people's heads, even a Kelowna in retired housing people love having the fresh air come in high but just don't ever 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 flood the room from the lower level they will be mad that's why you want to seal your plates to the floor seal up the whole thing so your only point of entry is where you choose it to be and that's at a high level and this right now we've used in Kelowna like I say in seniors 20 years ago and it goes over very very well but it's used all over Europe because it's simple and it's passive all except for this fan which drives it all the concept is this air would be admitted to your living and your bedrooms and this air you're removing is from the bathrooms the concept is is you're using the air once for people to breathe and live in have a fresh environment then when it's partly used up partly expended you send it to the bathroom where it picks up odor and moisture and then it goes out so you're using it twice before you throw it out that's why you can get away with such very very low rates um, you can get away with 20 CFM, 30 CFM for two people, you know, for 10 years straight. It works beautifully. What happens is, is people don't ha mind having fresh air up at the top. What they get really angry at is in the lower part of the body. And that's, it's really hard to separate thermal comfort from freshness here. But no, this is very effective even in Kelowna. The uh, application limitations of example four, minus 20 C or warmer. You can't use this in Kamloops. You can't in Vernon, uh, Kelowna. Less than 800 square feet. The smaller you build, the less square inches you have of leakage area and the better your inlets perform. So smaller is better, but the legal maximum is 1800. One story, non-forced air heat. And anyone who uses that system and has a chimney is an idiot. This is somewhat self-serving, but all of the information that we take the pleasure of sharing in the last years has come from Europe, because Europe is a full generation ahead of us in ventilation for the reasons they have more compact living, brutal energy cost and their densities are equal in living to that of us. So all the things I've talked about and the moisture problems have become critical specifically in France and in Sweden where they've got very advanced ventilation industries. So I'm going to show you some of the stuff we have, some of the stuff we don't, but it's mostly European. What they do in Europe right now is they have inlets that are very simple, very cheap, and they're four inch hole in the wall. Initially, when we put this into the code, we were going for six square inches of inlet through the upper sash, which is what Washington State does, and it's all over Europe, but the NAF standard squashed it, which is unfortunate. So you're into a separate opening through a wall to use in the land. And we get into all sorts of fancy stuff where that upper device is really beautiful. It measures the relative humidity in the room and will ramp up and ramp down accordingly. Because the problem with all ventilation systems is you're going to be too small for all the year, but January, February, March, people are going to complain about being too much because it's cold and it's dry, and your ventilation requirements are a third of what they would be in October.
This is something you'll never see, but it's absolutely beautiful. And in a building right now in France, a lot of masonry, six floor buildings, they have one fan on the roof. But of course, with one fan on the roof sucking out of all the bathrooms, it sucks out of the closest one the most. These devices are very, very inexpensive. You can buy them at 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 cubic foot a minute. You put it in the duct. Doesn't matter how close or how far from the fan you are, each bathroom gets exactly the same amount of air. These were patented way back in the 70s and they're still sold right now and there's nothing like it in the world. But there's no way that this would be saleable here because our ductwork isn't anywhere near in the league. This is self-serving, but this was a copy on some Swedish stuff where a grill normally stays at a partly open position and goes into full open whenever it's needed. So probably the most advanced work in all of the whole world right now is in France by a company called Serva. This shows four generations of exhausters that ha they have that go from 12 cubic foot a minute right up to 50 fully automatically. First generation with a pull string override. Second generation with a pneumatic override and third generation where it's fully automatic as occupancy sensing. So once you walk in, in 60 seconds, it'll override to full capacity. Otherwise, it seeks the humidity, and as your bathroom dries, it tapers down. Why is most of that technology not saleable? Because the duct systems that we're putting into Canada right now, specifically in BC, are absolutely deplorable. Here's a situation with a duct in, you can get put through the gyp rock. So who needs a grill? Who would expect it to work? when the air is being sucked from behind the gyp rock in the choice area. You know, there are cheap fittings that are made specific for purpose to guarantee the air that you're delivering to or taking from actually gets to the room of choice. But none of this shows up in the energy auditors and no building inspectors out there. And the only way you can protect yourself as a builder is become aware of these gross concepts and be very careful with the care and feeding of your HVAC trade. It's a valuable trade. I really believe right now that's the only protection a builder has in order to protect his homeowner is to select a trade with care, respect that trade's opinion, and don't try to put five tons of equipment in a two-ton duct system. We started doing this about 25 years ago, and we did it for the reason was, is the Swedes told us years ago how much air should come out of a grill. If you measure the grill, and we were finding that the HRV numbers of say 200 CFM We'd only find 100 CFM under the grills. We said, well, where's the problem? We're not measuring the grill correctly. We're not measuring at the machine. Well, we were horrified to find out that in fact, half of it was being lost as leakage. And that's what's happening today. It's just completely unacceptable. But we're actually testing air leakage on the duct system. And we've been blown away what we've observed. For example, I was in a house in Whistler, multi, multi million dollars, five HRVs that went in there, 200 CFM system on one of them. It was 153 CFM of leakage. The problem is right now is in our trade, the HVAC trade, the journeyman installs the sheet metal, but the apprentice is expected to come back later and seal it. That combination works commercially, but will not work residentially. And that is, is our duct is so tight to framing and the elbows are so much of its perimeter you can't get to. This elbow has eight feet of leaks, joint, gore, 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 joint. 96 inches of leakage in one single fitting. What's happened is we're putting pressure into this at normal pressure with a smoke generator and smoke just goes all over the hell's half acre. So essentially what happens is unless the system is put in with real care and attention, it's simply non-functional. Um, there is a company right now that I just met the gentleman yesterday, Matt from Pure Modern Air. They've just spent 50 grand on a franchise from um, Lawrence Berkeley Laboratories for what is called an AeroSeal product. And what you do is you connect up to your ductwork system in the location that we're detecting the smoke generator. You close up the openings, which is what we've done, and you put air into it. And he's taken this job from 80 cubic foot a minute in a grand total of 14 minutes and brought it down to roughly here. And you can see if you'd gone further, this likely would have leveled out. So he's going from roughly 85 down to roughly 10, and he's doing it in 14 minutes. But it's a very, very good system. We don't recommend that you resort to it because proper workmanship up front is a lower cost alternative. But at least you have something that you have in your tool belt as a fallback position to go to if you needed to. This equipment is online. It is available right now. 
This, unfortunately, is what most people at the provincial and the federal government level think about HVAC systems right now. They figure that all the problems with heating and cooling are lack of commissioning. I thought this cartoon was the best thing going, is that commissioning a system after gyprock and not doing it proper to start with is putting lipstick on a pig. Once this house is boarded over, all the strengths and all the weaknesses of Mike's work are there for the life of the house. It's not changeable. Yes, you could go back and aeroseal, but again, that's a pretty expensive thing to go back to. So just as in closing with four more slides following this, people love having ventilation, but of those that love having it, the equal number of people will turn it off, just as you very correctly pointed out. Generally speaking, they're turning it off for reasons of it being a bad installation or gross oversizing. I cannot stress that enough. I think that ventilation is the best thing I could have installed in my new home. Or, I have an HRV in my own home for 10 years, I love it, I'd be happy to share my experience with any prospective customer. But just to give you an idea of who to target with the efforts that you have as builders, your time is limited. Go after the Europeans. Go after the people that have a respiratory problem, because those are going to be your targets. Those people will understand and they will buy into this. But the average unwashed Canadian is a lost cause and you'll be far better selling kitchen counters and cabinets. Basically, our marketplace has not been driven by incentive, but purely working on the street. Our market for the last 40 years has been in custom homes where we have the bulk of the province. We did a pile of work up at Sun Peaks for a completely different reason. These all go into a rental pool and people go up and over-occupy them in Christmas and New Year's and the ski season, drying clothes, drying skis, million people in a suite, and these things are starting to rot around. Dansk, who built up there, does real good work. And for the last 20 years, they put ventilation in every one of their units and have had no problems at all, which most of their competitors have had. Their electric heat up there because there's no other option, so there's no chimneys. This is just something we picked up recently to us in Springs, and we're starting to get more multis, especially in seniors' complexes, because when you have density, you have potential problems. And when you build multis, you've got to acoustically separate unit to unit to unit, and you start doing stuff like that, and you start heating them with anything other than forced air with an outdoor air intake, and you get into serious problems on the multis as well. These ones here have been a technical nightmare, general pain in the ass, but we've probably got 300 swimming pools under our belt in the last 40 years. There's three gallons an hour evaporating off these surfaces. So if you ever, ever, ever do an indoor swimming pool or hot tub, be very, very, very careful. You have to build that room to a higher standard of insulation and draft proofness, and you have to have a very powerful mechanical system. And you're gonna basically look at, for 16 by 32, what would it cost to put a mechanical into that? 20 grand, 30 grand? Yeah. You can't do it, you can't do less or the place will rot. Any questions? Where would a source be to get inspections on um, my duct work that's been installed? Unfortunately right now, other than one customer in Seashell right now, no one's seen fit to bother testing systems. I don't have a quick answer for it because we're now trading on an area of general ignorance in the building market in this province. Mike, quick question for you. Uh, we, 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 we are starting to see a lot of trends like this on basement where the green joist is actually against the concrete. Yep. Did you run any issue with running your bathroom fan? Uh, yeah, we had to core holes through the, through the concrete. Oh, so you went right through the concrete. Yeah. Do you ever go to the first floor? Yeah, we can, yeah. It depends on, on every building is different, of course. Is it a lot? Is it going to be too, too much turn? How much well, of it? How much of a length uh, is maximum before and dumping that? Ten feet. Yeah. So depending on what you're using for a fan and, and, and how you size your duct accordingly to the total length of the, the run. Right. Okay. So if you're going on 100 feet, you're definitely going to upsize one or two sizes. And how far you should be away from the grate? Because when you're saying going through the concrete, this keeps coming in a lot of our projects and I don't quite understand. So if you're going out through the core through the concrete, yeah. generally we are very close to the grate. Yeah. Yeah, so. it's supposed to be, uh, what is it, 12 inches, 18 inches above grade? I forget. Yeah, in okay. the area. 12, 18 inches above grade. Yeah, just for snow. Uh-huh, okay. Yeah. Bathroom fans are running a lot of insulated flex duct because it's insulated already. Building okay. code requires any bathroom fan discharging through an unheated space has to be insulated to R4. 
It does not need a vapor barrier because the, the duct is the vapor barrier. It doesn't need R20 like a heating and air conditioning duct. R4 is enough, but it has to be kept warm so it doesn't sweat inside. And if it's flex, that's a quick way to do it. But like Mike says, you're going to have to upsize to offset the penalty of the corrugations. I have a question about the CO that you mentioned earlier. Uh, I've seen in many uh, renovations that uh, the, the only thing or the best thing that uh, most people do is just upgrading the, the kitchen uh, heat fan. And they usually put those hovercraft 800 CFM. I like that word, hovercraft. That's good. <laughs> That's good. So, but they don't actually do anything with the, with the furnace and uh, with, the, with the hot water tank, and most of the time they are not aware of the backdrafting. That question of the kitchen exhaust in a house has consumed more volunteer time in the last 30 years of our involvement with the ventilation code than all else together. The problem is today is a whole bunch of things. We have screwed over the public so long with fans that don't work, they're now overreacting and buying hovercraft. The problem is, if they have a hovercraft, and it's an ordinary Vancouver house, nothing matters because all Vancouver houses are built like Swiss cheese. And Steve Savage, who's worked on this before, has shown that the depressurization tests that he's showed, they've all passed because the fans are having no effect on the pressure of the house because the houses are so bad. But at the same time, these fans that are hovercrafts are being ducted in five inch and six inch sheet metal when it should be 14. But the problem is right now the kitchen and bath industry and it's an association, kitchen and bath association, they have a commercial interest in perpetuating the myth and their ignorance because they're selling hovercraft, getting the bucks for hovercraft that only move half what's claimed and then are causing other problems that they wash their hands of. What you referred to is a massive problem. And if this house had a chimney, that's a five, six, seven thousand dollar bill to bring in heated makeup air. No, your question's a big one. What we do tell the, uh, the, the trades that go through this course, if someone tells you it's a 600 CFM fan, unless they show it with a proper table of installed performance, assume it's 60% of that. Um, to find chimney, like what actually constitutes a chimney, and just refresh us again why, why it's bad. Oh, simple. A chimney can be metal or brick. It's just a stupid chunk of duct stood up with the magic expectation that air always goes one direction uphill. And that works as long as what's inside the chimney is hotter than what's around it. And that house isn't experiencing a negative from a 600 CFM fan. So that is what we call a naturally aspirated appliance, which is depending upon buoyancy to overcome the friction of going up through that height. It was that malfunction of that that caused the death in Fairmont. Okay, and why, why did that fail? Basically, the very simple thing was, is the boiler was not drafting correctly. The chimney was an outside wall, and no chimney in an outside wall will ever draft. That's why you can be stupid and legally do it, but the appendix says you shouldn't. A cold chimney won't draft, warm chimneys will. <coughs> They had so many pot lights in the top floor of that room that the air was escaping the pot light so quickly into the attic that it was negative at the basement so that the cold chimney could never draft because the boiler was being starved for air because it was exiting through, I think there was about 30 or 40 pot lights in the ceiling of this big house. Yeah. And then sample four on that HRV slide. The, the sample four was the passive inletting for secondary suites. Yeah, that one. Uh, up to 1,800 square feet, so that could be a bundle of, of say, 1,700 square feet. Yeah, the 1,800 square feet was a bit liberal, you know, practically speaking, keep yourself down to 1,000. Because <coughs> when you have a big, huge house, you have more inadvertent leakage, so your inlet performance becomes less and less and less the more leakage you have. Your inlet performance, which is your preferred point of entry for your fresh air, is raised when you get tighter and smaller. So say you're going to build that exam to like a step three or step four. Doesn't the inlets, it might be more comfortable, but doesn't it defeat the purpose of building a airtight home? No, that's what I was trying to say, is that tightness will always generate efficiency, will always generate comfort. If you use an example four, you want tightness because that way the point of entry, you control it, which is above people's head where they're very accepting of it. 
The step code, on the other, on the other hand, though, is a completely different animal. The step code is, is essentially an HRV promotion package because the modeling is done with quite high rates and it essentially will cause you to use an HRV as one of your lowest cost options opposed to boosting your wall or your windows or whatever to meeting target. So you never get step four with anything other than HRV to meet the target required of step four. So moving forward, this won't, this won't be a good model anymore as we move higher in the code. I don't know what the hell to do because right now, if you have a step four house in a secondary suite, one would presume that you'd do step four for the suite as well. And if you did, you're now getting into a real pig of capital cost. And where do you run the ductwork that is not impairing the separation assembly between your suite and the floor? And we have discussions at Tekka right now with fire safety people trying to figure out how we deal with secondary suites when the separation right now is 45 with no smoke detectors, 30 minutes with, and it's based on that assembly. So we're still learning that ourselves right now because that's a tough one.